Does God exist? I've been asked that question many times uh, by people. Does God exist? Uh, And uh, the world, by and large, uh, argues against the fact that God exists. Uh, Two uh, philosophers uh, wrote a little story to kind of explain how they viewed the world. Uh, Their names are are Anthony Flew uh, and John Wisdom, and they devised a little little modern-day parable to kind of put uh, whether God's there or not in perspective. I'll, I'll read you a little story. Everybody loves stories, do you not? You can't stop me anyway. I've got to, this is how I'm starting, so. Once upon a time, there were two explorers, and they came upon a clearing in a jungle. In the clearing, growing side by side, were many beautiful flowers and weeds. One of the explorers exclaimed, quote, some gardener must tend to this plot, unquote. So they pitched their tents, and they set a watch. But though they waited several days, no gardener was, was seen. Uh, perhaps, they said, he is an invisible gardener. So they set up barbed wire fence. They must have been from D.C. Uh, connected it to electricity. Uh, they even patrolled the garden with bloodhounds, for they remembered at that H.G. Wells uh, uh, concept of the invisible man that the invisible man could be both smelt and touched, though he could not be seen. But no sounds were ever suggested that someone had received an electric shock. No movements of the wire ever betrayed an invisible climber. The bloodhounds never alerted them to the presence of any other in the garden than themselves. Yet still the believer between uh, the two was convinced that there has to be a gardener. There must be a gardener. He must be invisible and sensible to electric shocks. A gardener who has no scent and makes no sound. A gardener who comes secretly, secretly to look after the garden which he loves, said the believer of the two. At last the skeptical explorer uh, despaired and he said this, quote, But what remains of your original assertion? Just how does what you call an invisible, intangible, eternally elusive gardener differ from an imaginary gardener or even no gardener at all? I would put to you, you are probably one or the other people. Those who look at the garden in the middle of the jungle and say, there's no way that this highly ordered, complex, specified complexity in this garden could have happened unless a gardener put it there. Uh, That gardener must be God. Uh, Or you might be on the other side of the equation because we have uh, them in our church or they're related to people in our church that are constantly posing this question um, who are saying, uh, in order for me to believe in God, uh, you're going to have to show him to me. I'm going to have to see uh, just rock hard evidence uh, that uh, that he is there. God therefore is, uh, from my perspective, uh, the skeptic would say, uh, just your Uh, prejudicial perspective that you might think he's there. I don't think he's there. I haven't seen him. Uh, Which one are you? 3,000 years ago, uh, David uh, wrote about that particular question. I mean, man had been struggling with that ontological question for many years. 3,000 years ago. He wrote a psalm about that very uh, very question. And notice what he says in verse 1 of uh, Psalm 1. He says, uh, when you look at life and whether God is there or not, what does he say? He says, the fool has said in his heart, there's no God. There's no God. Uh, They are, notice he says, they are those who believe that. They are corrupt. They have committed abominable deeds. There is no one who does good. Uh, uh, As he's looking at the world around him, and David spent much time as a shepherd on the hillsides looking at the star systems and everything that he saw. He's going to write about uh, that in Psalm 19 when we get there, that, you know, the wonder above your heavens just shows you the glory of God. But here in Psalm 14, he, he, he poses a, an analysis of the world about him that, that many in his culture were saying, there's no God. I don't see any evidence of God being there. He calls that kind of person, he mentions no words. What does he call them? He, he calls them a fool. Have you forgot I allow you to talk during church? Yeah. You're so, we're so online for so much, you're talking to the, the screen, you're thinking, he can't hear me, uh, but I can hear you. He calls them a fool. He calls them a fool. Um, the word for fool in Hebrew, nabal, is, is the word. It literally means something which wilts. Something which wilts. So just cut some nice roses in your yard, put them in a vase, what happens? Some hydrangeas, put them in a vase. They might be good for a while, but eventually because of the second law of what? Entropy, they're, they're going to decay. They're going to decay. And so a, a fool is somebody who wilts. Wilts in light of what? 
Well, a, a person who, according to the scriptures, is a fool, wilts in light of the evidence of, of, of God's existence that he's put into the cosmos. Either uh, that which he's built for you to see, general revelation, or that which he's given you to see and understand through specific revelation, like the scriptures. They wilt in light of that, and they have all kinds of arguments why they wilt. Uh, there was a man years ago, and by the way, the scripture is very clear about a person who is a fool. Proverbs 12, 15 says, the way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but a wise man is one who listens to counsel. Uh, Proverbs 18, 2 says, fools take no delight in understanding, but only in revealing his own mind. He's only concerned that you understand his worldview. He's not even going to listen to the evidence that you might say contrary to his worldview. He's a fool. Uh, Alistair McGrath uh, was a devout atheist back in the 60s. Uh, he was a Marxist. Uh, he was a lover of socialism. He was a hater of Christianity. Uh, he loved mathematics and he loved science and he excelled in both of those things. And so he was able to get into Oxford University uh, to pursue a higher degree in chemistry. He started his studies in 1971. He thoroughly enjoyed how his studies substantiated his view that there is no God. He thought he had viable reasons. From a Davidic perspective, we could say that back then Alistair uh, was a fool because he would listen to no counsel and wisdom and argumentation from a Christian. While at Oxford uh, University, he began to uh, run into Christians who were a little smarter than the ones that he had met before. Uh, and they began to question his thinking and give him arguments and understandings of why there is a God. He realized, he says, if you read his testimony of how he became a Christian, that he realized all of his arguments that were directed against God existing were basically straw man that he had created that he could easily destroy when talking to a Christian. But when he came fa face to face with Christians who were a little bit more uh, skilled in argumentation of proofs, uh, he found out that his uh, views began to fold like the proverbial lawn chair. Uh, 1971, he thought was going to be awesome at Oxford. It was awesome, but it was difficult at first as his entire worldview began to be challenged by the proofs of Christianity. And what he says he realized as he looks back at his life and what happened to him, uh, his, his evidences against God just started vaporizing as he realized, he says, I never really had spoken with Christians who kind of knew what they were talking about. They would just say, have faith. And he would say, well, what about reason? Eventually, he stopped and he looked at the arguments of Christians, and God's Spirit got a hold of Alex, Al Alistair McGrath, and then uh, he trusted Christ as his Savior. He went from being a fool who thought he knew everything because of math and science and realized, no, I didn't know anything until I came to know Christ, the living God. So what about you? Are you a foolish person or are you a wise person? Uh, there's only those two type of people in the world. And sometimes the foolish person disguises themselves as the wise person. Which one are you? Notice what uh, David says in Psalm 14. Let's read the whole psalm. He says, for the choir director, this is a psalm of David. He wrote this to be sung in church. He says, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. He says, they are corrupt, the fools. They have committed ab abominable deeds. There is no one who does good. The Lord who exists has looked down from heaven uh, upon the sons of man to see if there is any who understands, who, who seek after God. He says, they have all turned aside. Together they have become corrupt. There is no one who does good, not even one. Do all the workers of wickedness not know who eat up my people as they eat bread and, 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 and they do not call upon the Lord, by the way, who exists? There, the, there they are in great dread, for God is with the righteous generation." He says, you would put to shame the counsel of the afflicted, but the Lord is his refuge. Oh, that the salvation of Israel would come out of Zion when the Lord restores, because he exists, his captive people. Jacob will rejoice. Israel will be glad. We'll eventually get to verse 7 by Christmas or thereabouts. Profound passage, one that you need to understand. Why, why is there a God? Why is there a gardener in the garden of the cosmos that made it all? Uh, you can see in this, uh, in this passage, in these short seven verses, there's a cause-effect relationship between believing in God or disbelieving in God. Because if you disbelieve in God, i.e. verse 1, then everything else follows. Once you have checked out of God, then chaos ensues. This is the passage that Paul uh, used in Romans 3. Paul knew this passage well. When he looks at man and says, if you reject God, by definition, your world is going to fall apart. This is interesting. What is the ultimate solution to our culture's issues? And we have many issues 
as a culture, and many of them have surfaced in the last couple months, have they not? What are, the, what are the major issues? I will submit it to you uh, up at the front based on what we find from Psalm chapter 14 that our problems, our ultimate solutions to all of our, our cultural issues um, cannot be found by voting in the right candidate, voting out the right candidate, counseling, can, canceling people that don't agree with you, um, giving people more money that they didn't work for, coming up with more programs, etc. All the things the culture wants to do to fix things the problem of our culture is systemic denial of God. That's the answer, pure and simple. The systemic denial of God, the systemic rejection of God. Because once he's not your absolute, then anything in that relativistic world is, is possible by the ones who shout, scream, do the most to get their point advanced. Why should men not reject God? Well, let's look at it in Psalm 14, verse 1. Uh, what are the evidences that there is a divine gardener? Because if there's a divine gardener that's made it all, then I'm responsible for my life to him when I stand before him one day. Healing of our nation. Rest and understanding the essence of Psalm 14. Before we dig into this, I'm going to lay the groundwork today, and then we're going to spend a couple of weeks talking about the proofs that there is a divine creator who loves you and has a plan for your life. I got to say a, a few prefatory things because I know the church. And you're going you're gonna to want to know, what are the foundational things i got to understand before we dig into this? So let's, let's go through them. Number one, uh, I cannot give you undeniable evidences for the fact there's a God. Nobody can. If anybody says they can give you undeniable facts, uh, they're misled because it's impossible to give absolute undeniable facts. You can give facts. But it's left up to a person to look at the facts that God has embedded into the warp and woof of the cosmos and to make a decision about those facts by faith to believe in them. Number two, uh, J. Warner Wallace used to be a cold case homicide detective in, out in California. Uh, and he writes, as a Christian now, who writes defending the faith, he talks about the value of circumstantial evidence. He defines it this way. Circumstantial evidence, also known as indirect evidence, uh, does not prove something on its own, uh, but points us in the right direction by proving something related to the question at hand. It says this related piece of evidence can then be con uh, considered along with additional pieces of circumstantial evidence to figure out what happened at a given crime scene. I mean, what happened? I mean, my father as a federal agent used circumstantial evidence all the time. Is you're looking at a situation, you're analyzing all the things of that particular uh, situation, and you're coming to a conclusion based upon these lines of evidence, this is probably the most logical inference of what occurred. We're going to do that when we look at God. We're going to look at the evidence as God's built into the cosmos, that circumstantial evidence, to then look at it. Is it logical to believe in God or illogical? My summation is going to be, it's the most logical thing you could ever do. We'll get there. Number three, uh, we're totally, uh, typically told, uh, and I read all the time, I hear all the time, science has all the answers to life. Um, case in point, Peter Atkins, uh, English chemist. Uh, he's a fellow at Lincoln College uh, uh, at the University of Oxford. Uh, he says this about science, quote, he says, there is no reason to suppose that science cannot deal with every aspect of existence. Did you hear me? There's no reason to suppose that science cannot deal with every aspect of existence. That is a lie. There is every reason to believe that science cannot deal with every aspect of existence. Here, give me, let me give you some things to think about in relationship to science. Because he is a scientist, but he also believes in scientism, the worship of science as the essence of all meaning in the cosmos. Here's some questions that science uh, has huge issues with, but won't admit. I'll give you a few. These are not exhaustive. Um, why is there something rather than nothing? They can't answer that. They can tell you what is. They cannot tell you why it is. Um, why is there cosmic order and not disorder from a big bang? Why? Why is there complex order? Uh, how did something come from absolutely nothing and no one? How, how did that happen? What is my purpose? Why am I here? See, science can tell you certain things, but it can't. We'll get this to this in two weeks. When it comes to morals, where did they come from? I mean, when you look at morals uh, in, in evolutionary mindless matter, when it comes down to thinking about morals, science can tell me what cocaine is. It can identify it, tell me all of its chemical properties, but it can't tell me should you take it in vast amounts or not. Can't tell me that. It's a moral question. It's a moral question. 
So we, we look at science and realize it has excellent things to draw from to make life better, but it can't answer everything in life, no matter what Atkins says. Number four, even though we are talking about philosophical and logical evidences for God, I got to say right out front, don't get glassy-eyed on me. Don't check out. Don't have some flashback, like one lady told me one time, I felt like I was back at the university in a philosophy class. I didn't know what he was talking about. Just don't flatline on me, okay? You promise? Stay with me because God wants you to understand these things so that you can in turn challenge somebody with the faith. Here's the point. If Alistair McGrath, a thinking mind, a chemist, was led to Christ by some of the things we're going to talk about, won't it be beneficial for you to know some of these things to share with the next Al Alistair? Number five, saving faith does not arise from the evidences used to substantiate the existence of God. That's not how you get saved. It can lead you to saving faith, but that's not what saves you. Uh, what saves you? Acts chapter 4, Peter's pretty uh, uh, forthright in verse 10. What does he say after Pentecost? He says, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, uh, by this name, uh, this man stands here before you in good health. He, Jesus, is the stone which was rejected by you. Yeah, you tried to cancel him. You didn't cancel him. He's the stone that was rejected the, by the builders, but which became the very cornerstone. He's speaking of the church. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is, this is pretty clear, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which they must be saved. You are not saved by, I've, I've understood all the arguments for God that he exists. I totally get it. Now I believe there's a God. That will not save you. You get saved when you see Jesus as the God who left the glory of heaven to go to the cross, to bear your sin, to rise the third day. The day you see yourself as a sinner and need him as a savior, you become his child. Awesome. Anyway, those are just five foundational things to think about as we actually look at, is there a gardener? Is there a gardener? Um, we want to look at just one thing today. I was going to look at three concepts, but I figured that was probably too much for 30 minutes. I am learning after 34 years of preaching. <laughs> Praise God, right? Or thank God. <laughs> we want to look at just one thing. Uh, the law of causality. Law of causation. Remember I told you, don't check out on me. You promise? You still with me? Evidence from causation. I learned about causation a long time ago when I was a, a little kid. Uh, my mom, uh, who's, who's here with us now, had moved out here uh, and is loving the nice, warm, humid summer months. Uh, <laughs> yeah. um, I, I was a, a boy between two girls. It was like a pincer movement. I mean, I, my sister Marla was a year older than me. My little sister was six years younger than me. And then there was me. Uh, and, and causation works kind of like this. Uh, if I set up a whole bunch of dominoes and was going to play, you know, set up a really cool intricate thing and spend a whole bunch of time doing it, if I left the room and came back and all my dominoes are laying down, I got a couple options. Right? Okay, I'm in California. Perhaps there was an earthquake. Really? Well, if there wasn't an earthquake, I moved to make a couple other deductions, right? Uh, was there a pet that happened to run through where my dominoes were set up, and then I knocked them over? No, I didn't have a pet. No. What's my go-to answer? Sisters, there are the causation. Law of causality. Someone touched the first domino, and all of them went down. Julie? Marla? Mom? And I'll talk to dad when he gets home. Law of causality. Law of causality. Uh, this week, uh, walking into the kitchen here can be a metaphysical, ontological experience. You know, I'm working on my sermon. I'm working on this point. It's lunchtime. I, I go in the kitchen to get something to eat. And I put my uh, you know, Mexican food in the, in the microwave. And I'm kind of just standing there for two minutes while it's cooking. And I notice two, two round rocks on the counter. One's a rock. I mean, a rock rock, and the other one is painted bright blue. See what I mean? Law of causality. I begin to think to myself, hmm, I wonder how the blue one became blue. Do you think it just, was that by itself? Did it paint itself? Do rocks just have a coat of paint over them? No. It was caused by someone, perhaps, right? And then I find out later, because I found one of those rocks in my, in my perfectly manicured uh, walkway leading up to my house where I have river rock uh, strategically placed there. I am looking out at my river rock when I come home, and I see a red rock among my river rock. 
And it says something like, Jesus is here. I'm like, huh? And I talked to my wife, where'd that come from? I, I did that with the women's ministry. Oh, you were painting rocks this week. I found out. Uh, did, did you paint some rocks? See, no, you weren't there. Law of causality, law of causality. Uh, with, with every effect, there is a was. There is a what? There's a cause. There's a cause. Cause is either impersonal or personal. Who painted the rock in the kitchen? I mean, suppose I told you it was an impersonal force of the cosmos. Mm-hmm. You can't be our pastor if you believe stuff like that. You know, it was a personal person, probably a lady in the parking lot with a paintbrush. That's what they did. So let's look at causation. Dr. Norman Geiser, who uh, is now with God uh, in his presence, so God took him home. Uh, he wrote a book uh, called The Big Book of Christian Apologetics. And it, this book is like two columns. It's like 700 pages, like 0.8 font. And I, by the way, made the mistake when I took that class with that book. I read the whole book. It's massive. And then I'm with Dr. Geisler's son one day, my professor, in, in the car going to lunch. And he said, hey, how'd you like my dad's book on the big book of uh, Christian apologetics? I go, it's fantastic. He goes, you know, you only had to read about 30 pages in that book for this class. I about flipped the car. <laughs> no one told me. Uh, can you say type A personality? I mean, what was I thinking? So I've read this book. And in this book, he talks about causation. I'll define it for you this way. Remember, with every effect, there's a cause. Cause is either two things. What is it? Impersonal or personal. Here's what he says. Uh, we're going to talk about the cosmological argument. The cosmological argument is cosmos, the world. I mean, how did it get here? Uh, here's what he says. He says, the horizontal cosmological argument reasons back to a cause, with capital letters, of the beginning of the universe. Uh, the vertical uh, cosmological argument reasons from the being of the universe as it now exists. So part of it talks about the beginning, how this happened. And then the other part talks about the being of the cosmos. What keeps it existing? He says the former, uh, explaining how the universe came to be. The latter, explaining how it continues to be. The first calls for an originating cause and the latter for a sustaining cause. Where did this all come from? How does it still remain the way that it is? Uh, we want to look uh, first at the horizontal cosmological argument of causation. The law of causality. How did this get here? Remember, are you still with me? Okay. Uh, let's look at this. It's a syllogistic concept. Let's look at this. Everything that begins has a cause. True? True. True. Chair that you're sitting in has a chair maker. The, the mask that you're wearing has a mask maker, etc. So everything that begins has a cause. Number two, the universe had a beginning. Number three, therefore, summation of those major minor premises is the universe had a cause. As a cause. So J.P. Moreland puts this together, uh, and we want to analyze this. So we, we only have just a few options as we look at those concepts. So let's look at the fact that the universe, uh, uh, as it is, had a cause. And here's how Moreland, the great apologist out in uh, California, uh, divides it down for us. Here's your options. Number one, the universe exists now. So you have two sub-options. Option one, it had a beginning. Option two, it didn't have a beginning because it's eternal. Which one do you think a scientist would take that doesn't believe in God? Number two. Number two. Yeah, matter is eternal. Really? There is no way they know matter is eternal. Because science is based upon observation of the facts. And there's no way that they know in, in past time what exactly was going on. That's just an assumption. So they, the universe exists now. We all believe that because we are enjoying the universe as it is now. So then what are our options? It had a beginning or it had no beginning. Uh, we know that the, the cosmos is not eternal from a variety of ways to think about it. Uh, think about time for just a minute. Uh, you were waiting, you signed up to come to church. You knew it was going to be on Sunday. You knew it was going to be at 9 o'clock. It is now 9.59. My sermon's over. <laughs> you knew this was happening. It was happening in time and space. If infinity ex existed, there would be no right now, right? Because infinity is just infinity. It's just always is. But the fact that it's now 10.59 or 9.59, uh, we, we've been able to calculate time. When I stepped up here to preach, I knew what time it was, blah, 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 how much time I basically have. Everything's built around time, is it not? So we know because we can count time, and it's impossible to traverse infinity. You can't traverse infinity. Why? It's infinite. You can't say, well, I, I've, I've gone five hours into infinity. Because we live in a, a time zone of thinking, there had to be 
uh, the, the concept given to us through our logical reasoning that there, there, there had to be a time when this wasn't here. Number two, the universe had a beginning. There's your other option. The universe had a beginning. You have two options. It was either caused or it was uncaused. Uh, if it was uncaused, then we're saying that the effect of the complexity of the cosmos uh, had no cause. But we cannot logically say that an effect of this nature, of this complexity, uh, could be uncaused because there's no such thing as something that's an effect that's uncaused. Everything in that we know in the world uh, has, has been caused by something. You can't make a chair cause itself. If you want to st sit down here at the front of the stage and stare in, into this place of nothingness and wait till a chair materializes and it causes itself, have at it. We'll be in the new sanctuary years ahead of you waiting for you to see the chair appear. Nothing can just create itself, which means, well, the universe was caused. Well, then it was either personal or impersonal. And then third, the universe, he says, was caused. It had a beginning, and it was caused. It was either personal or it was impersonal. I would say you would be hard-pressed to convince me that the complexity of the cosmos and the wonder and beauty of the cosmos and just the concept of beauty in and of itself points to the fact that the cosmos was made by an impersonal force. What would cause an impersonal force to create anything? Nothing, because it has no personality. Why would it do it? Why would it do it? If you want to have a, a, a cosmos where uh, nothing created anything, here's how the late Francis Schaeffer puts nothing. Uh, I read this book right after I graduated from college. Here's what he says about that viewpoint that, well, we just came from nothing. He says, the first basic answer is that everything that exists has come out of absolutely nothing. He says, in other words, you begin with nothing. That's your view. Now he says, hold on to this view. It must be absolutely nothing. It must be what I call nothing, nothing. Uh, it cannot be nothing something or something nothing. If one is going to accept this answer that we all came from nothing, uh, it must be nothing, nothing, which means there must be no energy, no mass, no motion, no personality, no nothing. How could anything of what we see about us come from that nothing on an impersonal force. It's impossible. He goes on to, to say this. He says, the great problem with beginning with the impersonal is to find any meaning for the particulars. He says a particular is any individual factor, any individual meaning thing, uh, the separate parts of a whole. He said a drop of water is a particular and so is a man. If we begin with the impersonal, then how do any of the particulars that now exist, including man, have any meaning or significance? The point is they wouldn't. He says nobody has given us an answer to that. He says beginning with the impersonal, everything including man must be explained in terms of the impersonal plus time and chance. Do not, he says, let anyone divert your mind at this point. There are no other factors in the formula. Because there's no other facts that exist. If you begin with the impersonal, we cannot then have some form of a teleological concept, which means design concept. It'd be impossible. How could that which is impersonal, how could the electricity flowing through your house create anything in your house? Can't. He says, no one has ever demonstrated how time plus chance, beginning with the impersonal, can produce the needed complexity of the, of the cosmos, let alone the personality of man. No one has given us a clue to this. And he wrote this back in the 70s. And it's still as true then as it is, then, uh, as it is today. No one can answer those questions. How did the impersonal give us the great personal complexity? You know, Scripture is very clear when you look at the cosmological argument. It puts it this way. Colossians chapter 1. I love this passage. What does Paul say? Well, for he, Jesus, he delivered us from the domain of darkness. He transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we, in, in Jesus, we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins that Paul talks about in Psalm 14. He says, and he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him, by Jesus, notice what he says carefully. All things were what? Created. Where? Uh, well, both in, in the heavens, in the cosmos, and on the earth, visible and invisible, whether they're thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, those are all words for angelic powers in the Greek text. Whether it's seen things or unseen things, he says all things have been created by him, and why were they made? For Jesus. He's the creator God. And he says in the, in the cosmological argument, there's enough evidence to, to, to teach you that he's there. He's there. Let's look at the vertical aspect of the cosmological argument. So the, first, the horizontal tells us what? It, it tells us that, uh, how, did, how did this begin? 
And then the vertical tells us, how does it continue to exist? Uh, here's how Dr. Geisler, when I was taking his class on this topic, put it. He says, something exists, which is you. Two, nothing cannot produce something. Logical conclusion. Three, therefore something exists eternally and necessarily. Four, I am not necessary an eternal being since I can change. See, a necessary being like God never changes. That's why he says I change not. Because God can't by definition change. Thus, both God, a necessary being, and I, a contingent being, exist. And that is theism. What does the scripture say about this? Um, Psalm 9, what does it say? But the Lord abides for how long? He abides forever. See, he's, outside, he's outside of time and space. Uh, he has established his throne for judgment. Psalm 10, 16, the Lord is king forever and ever. Again, he's outside of time and space. Uh, Psalm 45, thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. Um, Psalm 92, but thou, O Lord, art on high forever. See, because we're in a limited world of time and space, he's not. He's not. All of this top, top type of talk always leads to the following question. I don't even know how many times I've answered this question. From little kids to adults. And I've asked the same question myself. If we live in a, a place of cause and effect and we can't get out of it, who made God? See, I told you how this sermon's going to last a couple weeks. <laughs> who made God? Short answer is? What's the short answer? He always was. Uh, the text I just read, he, he always was. He, he always, he, no, he wasn't made. He wasn't made. See, the truth of the law of causality, of cause and effect, does not mean, uh, as has been pointed out, that, that everything that is has a cause. It only means that everything that has begun to begin has a cause. God never had a point where he began to begin. He's the beginner who always was. He's without causation. He's the uncaused one. See, look at it this way, and I've told you this before, but I'll have to tell you again because it's been a while since we talk about it. If you take a chain, and each point of the chain represents cause, effect, cause, effect, cause, effect, and you go back uh, in time. That can't go on into infinity. It's called the law of infinite regress. You cannot have cause and effect back to infinity in philosophy. Why? Well, there has to be the first cause. How do you explain a caused universe without a God to hang the nail of cause effect on? See, there has to, by definition, be one greater than cause effect who's uncaused or the great mover. Why am I a Christian? Well, because I as a young man sat down and thought about this. Is there, is there reason to believe in a divine being? Absolutely. Absolutely. See, it's this kind of reasoning, this general understanding that can then lead me to special revelation so I can find the Christ. See, years ago, Alex or McGrath thought he was a believer, but he was really a fool because he rejected God. But then once he started looking at arguments like this, he understood there is a God who loves me and who died for me. So why is there a gardener in the garden? Why is there a gardener? I'll give you three ideas. Number one, the presence of a, of a garden in a jungle of all places, uh, which is an amazing effect, does not occur with a, about a viable personal cause, i.e. a gardener. It just doesn't happen, right? Two, the presence of a manicured garden, which stays this way whenever you visit it, suggests there, there has to be a gardener, whether you see him or not, who keeps it manicured. And three, since the matter which forms the garden is not eternal, but highly tempor temporal, scientifically speaking, uh, there must be some kind of amazing gardener who's not bound by the temporal laws of the cosmos in which we live. Well, that's God. That's God. You know I love gardening, correct? What does it take to have a really nice yard? That's a sermon series in and of itself. What does it take? Somebody called me last night after I, wa I was worked in my yard all day yesterday. I got a phone call last night. Hey, you got to help me. You got to A person has never called me before. You got to help me. I've got violets coming up in my yard. They're taking over. And not a spiritual question. A violet question. Okay, it's like sin. It's taking over. Got to deal with it. I've tried everything. I bought this. I bought that. And I said, well, you bought all the wrong things. Because you need speed zone. Yes. <laughs> See, you know, you're trained. Let's make, a, let's make that spiritual. See, you got a spiritual problem? Sin. Psalm 14. Because you deny God, your life shows that you don't believe in God. It's chaos. But what is Jesus? Well, he's like speed zone. 
See, he's the, I'm kidding you not. You might think it's funny, but isn't he the answer? He is the answer because he can deal with sin because he is. I don't know where you're at on the map of where you stand with God, uh, but there's plenty of evidence if you pay attention that he is there and he is not silent, as Schaefer wrote many years ago. He speaks most profoundly if you listen. Let's pray. God, we pause to give you adoration and praise. You have built into the cosmos so many evidences. Your fingerprints are everywhere, uh, from the, the construction of the complexity of a DNA strand uh, down to the wonder and the beauty of the stars over our head. Uh, all speak loudly, as Paul says in Romans 1, of your greatness. If anyone in our body does not believe in you, might you guide them to a saving faith as you did in Alistair McGrath's great life and now use him to advance your kingdom. What a great work you did. Do that again in someone else's life. And for we who know you, might we begin to study at a different level to grasp the evidences for the fact of why we serve you, the living God. And because you are with us, we shall not fear. May we give testimony in Christ's name, amen.